destination, destination, a final, a final destination, like in the words of the good Lord to Peter, Domine qua vadis, Peter, where are you going? What is your destination? Three men have traveled at least, we believe, five to six months, maybe a year to get to meet the Christ child. My brother in Christ, since you are first century Jews and you know Jewish scripture, may I introduce you to the three. My brother and sister in Christ, just so you know, the elder statesman on the end, his name is Melchior. Melchior will pass shortly after meeting the Messiah. He's like Simeon in the high priest who circumcised Christ. He just wanted to lay eyes on the newborn king. Now remember, it takes him almost a year to get there. This is why Herod is killing everybody two years and younger. He's trying to make sure that somehow or another in this massive net that he's going out there, he's going to catch the Christ child. He's, uh, if you will, Melchior uh, brings the myrrh. It's a burial ointment. My brother and sister in Christ, man, how does that go over at a birthday party? The next gentleman that you see here has got kind of like a little bit of an orange cap. His name is Balthazar. He brings the incense. You want to blame somebody for the smoke? That's your boy right there. All that coughing, that's his problem right there. My brother in Christ, and last but not least, is Caspar who brings the gold. My brother and sister in Christ, remember now, they come from several different countries. They all speak different languages. They meet along the way. They show up at a house, not a grotto. We also believe, according to the saints, that is the first blessing that the Christ child does in the sign of the cross. They all knelt and lay prostrate before him. And with the help of the Blessed Mother, the child who is two years old, he's still God, makes the first sign of the cross according to our traditions. More importantly, my brother in Christ, remember this. There's always a miracle behind the miracle. How does, be honest with you, how does Joseph afford to move his family to Egypt? He's got no burrow. He's got no money. It's the gold. My brother and sister Christ, the good Lord has always taken care of all the little intangibles. Now, this is what you need to understand. They traveled all the way following a star to meet Herod. You need to understand who Herod is in the world. Herod was put in place by Caesar. Caesar puts him in place as a kind of a puppet. And as a result, he takes the title, grab this, King of the Jews. He's not even Jewish. He's an Edomite. So when three guys show up saying, where's the king of the Jews? Can you understand why he gets a little incensed? This is the type of person Herod is. Herod has killed his favorite wife. That's right, his favorite one. He has killed several of his children. He has several known diseases, some that aren't even known back in their day. Matter of fact, my brother and sister in Christ, he is off the charts. Even Caesar said this of Herod. It would be better for you to be Herod's pig. He's supposed to be Jewish than it would be to be a family member of Herod. These three guys know exactly who they're going to meet. So it's important to them that they get in, see him, and leave. This is why the star is not seen by Jerusalem or by Herod. And they don't pick it up till after they leave. My brother in Christ, they left their families because the ultimate destination was to see the Christ child. They don't know if they're going to have a home when they get back. They don't know if they're going to get through Herod. They don't even know if they're going to see him. They pack up their families and everything they own and they go to see him because the destination is the journey. It is the goal. My brother's Christ, look, go back in scripture. Our best players are people that never lose sight of the destination. You know what John the Baptist taught you and I? Clothes don't make the man. Doesn't matter. Only thing that matters is I baptize the Christ child. You know what, um, you know what Mary Magdalene taught you and I? That no matter how bad your past is, no matter how bad it is, it's only where you go from this day forward. Every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. My brother and sister in Christ, you know what Veronica taught you and I? That's the one with the veil. That no matter how small your gift is, it's given with great intention, with great love. It's the most powerful thing in the world. 2,000 years later, we still have the veil at the Vatican. My brother and sister in Christ, you know what St. Paul taught you and I? That no matter how many times you get knocked down, and it's going to happen, the only answer is, will you stand up? Will you finish what has started to arrive at the destination? My brothers in Christ, here you and I sit 2,000 years later. 
You and I need to focus on what's our destination. We got one job, one, and that's to get to heaven. Our names have to be in that book of life. Your name, my name, your family's name, that's the destination. Anything before that is totally irrelevant. My brother and sister Christ, think for a second. How many times this, yesterday, this week, this past month, something has happened in your life, some situation totally jettisoned you off the trajectory of where your destination was to go. Man, you got that email and you got so wrapped up in it. Man, you couldn't wait to respond back to it. As if somehow or another, you responding to that email was significant. My brothers in Christ, how many times do I hear y'all tell me? I don't care what other people think. That's right. You shouldn't. My brothers in Christ, remember this. What other people think of you is none of your business. My brothers in Christ, did not Mother Teresa tell you and I this? People are unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are honest, they will cheat you. You be honest anyway. If you are successful, you win false friends and true enemies. You succeed anyway. If you are happy, people will be jealous. You be happy anyway. You build something over a lifetime, they destroy it overnight. You build it anyway. Because it was never between you and them. It was between you and him anyway. My brother, sister Christ, don't understand what I'm trying to tell you. Do not allow people to get in the way between you and making the gates. you got to get to heaven. Anything else is totally irrelevant. You're only going to spend 90 or 100 years on this planet. And then what? My brother and sister Christ, I'm telling you, don't get distracted. Don't allow the decimal point to dictate whether you do or don't do. Judas has already proven what happens when you tie your name to a decimal point. Do not tie your name to a job description. You do what you do because you are a follower of Jesus Christ. You do what you do because you're a good Catholic man and woman. You do what you do because you're a Catholic doctor, Catholic engineer. You're a Catholic teacher. You're a Catholic. That's why you do what you do. You're a follower of Jesus Christ. Do not get distracted, my brother in Christ, on your destination. Don't allow an email, a text message, an understanding, a job, an argument. Do you not understand? Every decision you make, every decision you make, no matter how trivial, speed up, slow down, go left, go right. Are you walking towards him or are you walking away from him? You are never neutral to him. When you miss a mass, you jettison yourself from your destination because you didn't have time for it. How many times do I hear people say, Father, man, I, I went to, Father, I went to Disney World. Oh, in-laws, outlaws, kids, I'm so exhausted, I need a vacation for my vacation. Man, Father, I just, I, I miss Mass. You found Cinderella's Castle? Oh, absolutely, Father. Should have found the church. Not my fault. Go to, go to confession. My brother says, Christ, that's the point. What is your rule of life, no matter what you're doing in this world, at work, at home, at rest, at the camp, where you're fishing, you're hunting, you're shopping, you're with your family, your friends. What is your rule of life? Not to be jettisoned from your destination. Do you not understand? Not everybody's going to make the dance. The gates to heaven are small. The gates to hell are large. Stop buying into the argument that everybody's going to make it. Someday, I pray, somebody will stand up at a funeral and for the love of Christ, just tell the truth. I don't think he made it. Everybody's in a better spot? Then what are we here for? My brother and sister Christ, remember this. There's redemption and salvation. Redemption is the crucifixion. Salvation is the pearly gates. Just because he died on the cross doesn't mean you and I get a free pass. When they ask you, are you saved? I was. I am him. I'm talking to you today. He made the last words off of my lips to his ears save me. And I hope to be because we have free will. you got to make sure that you stay on the road. It's a beautiful interstate. You get on at baptism. You go a little farmer and confirm what your parents said is true. That you believe in Holy Mother Church. You believe the Eucharist is true. You believe she's ever virgin. And guess what? You get sick along the way. Pull over in the in, uh, emergency lane and I will anoint you. Guess what? If you want to get married, pull over and get in the, into the uh, carpool lane. You want to get in my lane, the bike lane. So be it. You want to stop along the way and call a priest for confession to call box? Then you do it. It's all built over the Eucharist. 
and then I'll take you right to the pearly gates. My brother Christ, listen to me. Churchill was right. If you stop and argue with every barking dog, you'll never make your destination. Every time the devil begins to bark at you, as Padre Pio said, why do you and I stop to entertain it? The ugly email, the text message, the phone call, the group, the meeting, the dinner. Why do you stop the entertainment? What other people think of you is none of your business. Every time you and I stop to argue with the barking dog, we lose track of our destination. We have been jettisoned. My brother Christ, I'm telling you, get back to church, go to confession, stay close to him. More now than ever before, stay focused on your destination for you and your children so that your name is in the book of life. I promise you, I promise you, he'll make good to you. And I leave you with this. Quote, do not allow any situation, do not allow any situation to jettison you from your destination. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Doubt. Doubt. It's a million to one shot. I mean, pure coincidence. No way, no how. It's just one of those things leads to doubt. Circumspect. We're not sure. We begin to take a step back. My brother and sister in Christ, it's uncanny. It's a million to one shot. It's unheard of. The coincidences, pure coincidences, between President Lincoln and President Kennedy. I mean, Lincoln is, comes president in 1861, and then Kennedy becomes president in 1961. Isn't it amazing that both presidents have vice presidents named Johnson? Isn't it? It's a coincidence, right? That I mean, both presidents were shot from behind with their wives with them. It's amazing. It is. Think about it. Lincoln, the guy that shoots Lincoln, shoots him in a theater, runs to a warehouse. The one that shoots Kennedy, shoots him in a warehouse, runs to a theater. I mean, it, it, it's got to be a mirror of one shot because Lincoln is actually, the, the carriage he drove was a Kennedy carriage. Huh. Link, uh, Kennedy was in a Lincoln Continental. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know what's amazing, my brother and sister in Christ? Both men were shot from behind, both assassins were assassinated, and they were both assassinated on Good Friday. See, doubt's already creeped in. It's a million and one shot. You honestly believe that the good Lord looked down? Oh, oh, oh my, me. It's, it's a million. Peter, get Thomas. You're not going to believe. Watch, watch it. Look, it's 100 years. What, look what happens. My brother and sister in Christ, that is exactly what that gospel is about. I do not know him. Wait a minute. You're three months older. Mary comes to your house with Elizabeth and Zachariah, the high priest. You dance in the womb. He's your cousin. And you're telling me you've never seen him before? That's exactly what he's telling you. He's saying the last time I saw you was in the womb. And the only reason I danced is because the Blessed Mother entered with a greeting, first intercessory prayer. As soon as that's over, he goes to school. We say the wilderness, but there's a school out there called the Essenes. They are um, celibate men who are dedicated to the temple. They do not belong to the Pharisees or Sadducees. They are very strict. They are unshaven. They have certain eating habits when they're outside of their compound, locusts and wild honey. They oftentimes wear a beard. That's why you see sometimes St. Joseph with a beard. So they're very strict order. He's saying, I didn't know him until he walks up and then I see him. My brother says, Christ, look, listen to what I'm telling you. John the Baptist recognizes him by sight when he sees him. He feels it. It's the essence. It's the understanding. And just so you know, you're a first century Jew. You need to understand these things. As soon as you know this, when you hear the words that the heavens were opened... It's not like the clouds parted and it's a beautiful day. It's schismo, schism in their life. Somebody tore it open. Then a dove descends. Then the God the Father says, this is my son who I am well pleased. That's how everybody comes to know. But John the Baptist knows before him. He's telling you, the reason I know him is because I was baptized in the womb. Now I've come to recognize him. Now I know him by sight. No doubt about it. That guy's the Messiah. My brother's Christ, now stop. 
as a first century Jew, here's the problem. Everybody's looking for a Messiah. But the problem is, who are you looking for? To some, it would be a warrior, somebody that can bring the country back together because it's fractured. Some people are looking for a political guy who has the, the ways and the means. Some people are looking for pure money, that he's just got the ability to sim sim simply just purchase it and make it happen. And then there's another group, my brother and sister in Christ, that have no idea who they're looking for. The fact of the matter is, you know what they're looking for? They're looking for Moses. Deuteronomy says it. Moses says it in the book. He says, you got to look for somebody like me. I'm going to take you out of slavery. What does Christ want to do? Pull you out of the slavery of sin. I'm going to bring you into the desert and bring you manna, which is blessed bread from heaven. And then Christ says, I'm the bread of life. Oh, stop, stop. My brother says, Christ, if they had blessed bread from manna that fell from the altar of God, if they had it blessed, ours cannot be less than. It can't be a relic or theory or conjecture. It has to be greater than. The New Testament always is greater. As a matter of fact, Moses is going to say, I'm going to bring you to a new promised land. The good Lord is going to tell you, I'm bringing, trying to get you to heaven. And by the way, Moses is saying there's going to be a new temple. Christ is saying in three days, they'll destroy the temple and I'll raise it up. They're looking for the wrong guy. They're not looking for somebody who's going to be poor, born in Bethlehem with no sandals and no roof over his head. They're looking for the wrong one. But it doesn't change the fact that it is true. My brother's Christ, look, go back in Scripture. Our best players are the ones plagued with doubt. Why does Mary Magdalene get up on Easter Sunday? She'd rather be in near a dead Savior. No, listen, she thinks he's dead. Her words even confirm that she's dead. When she gets there and the rock is moved, she sees Christ, thinks he's a gardener, and says, where have you laid him? I.e., where did you take the body to go bury him yet again? And when he says, Mary, she says, Rabboni, do you know she grabs him so hard? In Greek, she literally tackles him. Do you remember the words that he said? He said, do not touch me, for I have yet to ascend to my father. So listen to what I'm telling you. When he tells the good thief on the cross, this day you'll be with me in paradise. No doubt about it. He's not in heaven on that day. Because the good Lord hasn't gotten there yet. He just told Mary Magdalene three days later, I have yet to get to my father. So I want to erase the doubt of Abraham's bosom. Where is Moses, Elijah, John the Baptist, Jeremiah, St. Jo uh, Joseph? Where are they before the gates are open? Abraham's bosom, the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Paradise. That's why he says, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Our best players are plagued with doubt. But it didn't keep Mary Magdalene from doing what she needed to do. That's the point. Just because you have the doubt doesn't mean you stop doing what you're doing. My brothers in Christ, Longinus, if you had to start a city, and you're a Roman provincial, you're Caesar, you're Pilate, um, you're Herod, that's uh, King Herod's son. My brothers and sisters in Christ, if you knew that, the first guy you want is Longinus. Everybody respected Longinus. He's the one in the battle that led everybody to safety. He's the one that made sure his troops got fed and they did what they needed to do. He was the one that made sure they got the supplies. If you're going to be in a foxhole, Longinus is the one you want next to you. So when he makes the statement, truly that man's the son of God, can I tell you there must have been doubt before? Because why else would you make the statement? He learns it through the crucifixion. That's the only times he's confronted with him. For him to make that statement is erasing the doubt. Do you know about six months to a year later he's beheaded? By the same guys that he protected. Why? Because Pilate said, man, I want his head on a pike. Guess what? His head goes on a pike. My brothers in Christ, I tell you these things because doubt is creeping into your heads. And I need you to stop it before it grows too far. You start to question whether the church is true. Think, my brother, listen to this. I don't care who the manager is. I don't care who the management or the pontiff is, per se. I don't really care, per se, what the president says or doesn't say. The only thing I care about is what you do and what you say. It's your soul I'm worried about. You know the truth. Don't get caught up in all this rhetoric. You know the truth. No doubt about it, the church is true. 
Do not get caught up in the management, what they say or don't say. The only thing that matters is, is that you know the truth. Because it's going to be your soul. What, what's going to be our card on Judgment Day? You think you're going to stand up before the good Lord and say, well, 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 well not my fault. Francis, go talk to him. Go talk to Biden. Somebody needs to. Might as well be you. You go talk to him. But brother, says Christ, that's your judgment is your judgment. So what's your whole card? That's my problem is you allow doubt to get in and you start to question because of the pedophile issue, the homosexual issue, uh, malfeasance. So therefore, because it's, it's, in, it's in the church, therefore, it's all contaminated. You know better than that. My brother in Christ, you can't allow doubt to come in. Go back and think. Let me, let me put it to you this way. My brother in Christ, if you and I lived in the time of Christ and we hear he's crucified, we don't make it to the crucifixion. But you have friends that want to be converted. You have questions about the faith. Who do you go to? You're going to look for the twelve. Peter, James, John, Nathaniel. What if it's the year 66 and you find out that they're all dead less John? What are you going to do now? You're going to go find John. Do you know there are about 10 pontiffs from Peter before John departs? Who do you think those 10 guys went to to break ties? Who do you think those 10 guys went to to make sure this was done right? My brother said, Christ, I can tie myself back to Bishop Munch. Bishop Munch can literally tie himself to John Paul II. And from John Paul II, I can tie myself all the way back to Peter. Here's my point. You can't have 40,000 truths in the world today. That's insane. My brother in Christ, every time you and I would worship with Christ in his day, no matter what city we're in, Jerusalem to Caesarea Philippi to Sea of Galilee, we all worship the exact same way. My brother says, Christ, the good Lord gave us a rule book to follow, and the rule book is the Holy Mother Church and the teachings of the Mass. I'm telling you, there is no doubt about it. I've already been everything else. I mean, at some point, I even made it up because it's just easier. I mean, I like once saved, always saved. I mean, what the Sam Hill is that? I mean, I just, I can sleep around, do what I want, cheat on people, taxes, backstab, and all I got to proclaim is to be the Savior of the world? I mean, are they the Ten Commandments or the Ten Sticky Notes? You did write them with your finger, didn't you, big guy? I mean, you did it twice. So my point to you is, why do you allow doubt to creep into your heads? Why do you worry about going to confession? Well, Father, I just go directly to big guy. The big guy never said it. He never did it. Didn't baptize anybody either, for that matter. Hebrews 5, I would choose priests among men for the forgiveness of sins. No one is to take it upon themselves. So why is it that you feel that you can still go directly to him? What's your whole card when you see him? I just felt I could. Did you read my book? Did you study the scriptures? Did you not he read Hebrews 5? My brother's Christ, go to confession, throw up, and put it, walk away. Every sacrament has an outward sign, Thomas, so that you know it took place. Water hits your head so you know your sins are forgiven. You wear white so that your soul can be seen as I see it. When you come to communion, you chew the host. When you get anointed after Mass, I put oil in your hands. You go to confession, you hear your sins are forgiven. My brother's Christ, everything in the church is true. Just because you don't like the rule doesn't mean it's not applicable. My brother in Christ, how many times do I hear people say, well, Father, I'm, it's contraception. I got to tell you, we, we want children, but we really want them on our terms. And we're not, we're, financially, we're not ready. Is he the God of supply and demand or is he not? Is he omnipresent or is he not? Are you going to take children when you're supposed to because when he wants it and he wills it? Did you not sing the psalm today, your will be done? My brother and sister Christ, therein lies the point. You make a little exception here, in about a year from now, it's going to be this wide. The question for you and I is you got to get the doubt out of your head. How many times do I hear you proclaim to me, Father, I'm praying for my daughter, my son. They can't get out of the woods. Oh, my God. Forest for the trees, man. It's drugs, it's alcohol, it's this, it's that. It's the in-laws. Man, I pray for them, but look, no, no, nothing's happening. I tell you what, no prayers. Cut them off. That's it. No prayers. Everybody go home. Now watch how far everybody falls. Your prayers kept them from falling all the rest of the way. Into prison, not getting out, committing a crime, possibly maybe even suicide. My brother in Christ, I'm telling you, when the devil plants the seed of doubt, 
what he does is he festers it and grows, and pretty soon it starts leaping, and you make exceptions to the faith. I'm telling you, stick to your guns. I promise you. Listen to me. I promise you, your prayers are being heard. The answer may be no. It may be not right now. If our job is to get to heaven, and he's the God, and he's the one that controls heaven, shouldn't he be in a better spot to determine what works for us? So maybe the answer isn't no, isn't right now. Or maybe the answer is yes. You ever thought for a second that the reason he keeps telling you no is because that's the only time you ever come back to him? You ever thought the reason he doesn't answer your prayers right away is because he'll never hear from you again if he does? You ever thought for a second he just loves being around you so much that if he keeps telling you no for at least a little while, he'll see you more times than not? Because once he gives you what you need, he won't see you until you need him again. My brother in Christ, I'm telling you, stay close to the church more now than ever before. If there's ever a time to double down on going to the sacraments, to receive in the Eucharist, remember his words to you. My flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. And if I'm not in you and you are not in me, you do not have eternal life. I don't care how you count this by. You don't go to mass. Your chances of making it are negligible. Say what you will, but the Eucharist is the source and summit of our lives. Keep holy the Lord's day. There's only one thing holy, and it's in that tabernacle. That's why you've got to get married in front of him, and not on a beach, and not in somebody's home, because you've got to be in front of him. That's why you and I have to receive him, because it's all we got. I'm telling you, do not allow the devil to get in your head. My brother and sister Christ, I leave you with this. May the devil pull it out of your dead hands when you're through. Doubt or not, you finish what we started. A poor prayer prayed is prayed nonetheless. That one prayer that you want to stop praying because you're tired and frustrated, that's the one that's going to win the day. My brother and sister in Christ, doubt kills more things than failure ever will. Amen? Amen. 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 There you go. My son, Holy Spirit. <laughs> salt. Salt. As in salt of the earth. Are you worth your salt? The year is 2004. Everybody that is going to the seminary, by and large, about 100 young men, or about 95% of them are the age of 20 to 23. There are about 10 of us who are over 40. They refer to our part of the hall as the geriatric wing. We thank you. Everybody is kind of worth their salt because they've been to a junior seminary. They've learned different things. They understand theology better. They understand liturgy better. Uh, they may understand the workings of the well of the church, the catechism, quote, in a day, end quote. But for those of us who are change of life guys, you kind of got to prove your salt. So my first class that I'm involved in is philosophy. Ouch. First class, I show up with my legal pad. I don't have a laptop. I came from a business. I had administrators. I had secretaries. I had finance. I had this, that, and the other. I didn't need, quote, a laptop. I did everything on a legal pad. I show up to my first class in philosophy. There's 20 young men in there, all the ages 20 to 22, and they got laptops. The teacher walked in and says, my name is Dr. Jacobs, and today we're going to learn about Bean. Yeah, boy. Bean. B-E-I-N-G. And I remember thinking, oh, my God. We're going to burn a day talking about who? I said, what's worse is we're going to pay a guy to talk about this all day. Well, he says, this is how it works. When test time comes, I will give you 50 words, of which I will pick 25. They will be definitions, and then you'll have a couple essays. By the time the final comes, can I tell you I am at the line of not passing? I'm there. You pass final, you pass. You don't pass, you go home. He says, I'm going to give you 100 words. I will pick 50, so that means you've got to memorize 100. As you know, one of the greatest blessings is the ability to memorize, so I memorize all 100. He said, and then we'll have a couple essays. He gives us the 50 definitions in the test. I'm sitting right in front of him, right? You got the class around you. And then he has these essays. I know. You know. He knows. I'm not getting anything on the essays. I read the essay. I'm not even sure what language that is. 
I'm looking at it. I'm saying, I'll take the two other 50 words I memorized and just stick it in there, hoping one of those will pop up in the essay. As a result of it, I go through the test. Man, I fill it out. Man, I'm telling you, my brother and sister Christ, I'm in trouble. I go back and start counting the points. That's two, that's four, six. I ain't getting nothing for that. I wouldn't even give me anything for that answer. I'm there. I am two points short. I know of passing this class. I'm not taking it again. It was painful enough the first time. I ain't going through this again. I'm not going to be the first seminarian to fail day one of semester one. As a result of it, I add up the points. I'm in trouble. I'm looking around. These guys, man, they're, oh my gosh. I mean, it's just nonstop. Except the guy next to me, who's my age. I look at him, and he looks at me like, don't look over here, brother. There ain't nothing happening. <laughs> okay? He looks at me like, if we're going to cheat, this is going to be the time to do it right here. <laughs> you know that little angel that's on your shoulder that says, okay, you're in the seminary. Do right. Okay? And then the devil's in my ear. Yeah, you're going home this afternoon. You better cheat. Okay? So I'm trying to get this angel off my shoulder, right? So finally, I, I can't take it. I said, uh, Dr. Jacob, uh, are, are you going to have a bonus question? <laughs> and he, he looks at me. This is a master's program. You don't get bonus questions? I said, oh, okay. And I said, so he says, well, Really? You want a bonus question? I said, yeah, I think it would help. <laughs> you know? So he said, well, let me, I'm going to think about it. So I put my pen down. <laughs> so he just looks at me, and I'm thinking, look, <laughs> either you're going to help me or I'm going to cheat. I'm, we're getting out of this class, okay? <laughs> well, man, he finally says, okay, seminarian beard. By this time, now people have stopped. What do you want? I said, how about five quotes. You put the quote up, we guess the person. Now, think where more I'm at. Like, I'm thinking about, um, you know, do not, you know, um, do not shoot till you see the whites of their eyes, or I have not yet begun to fight, right? I, I'm, I need two, two points. I know it. So he puts up these five quotes, and I look at him, and I'm thinking, I look at my buddy, and he said, you know, I don't know nothing. I said, I said uh, so uh, are you going to have a word jumble over here on the other side? <laughs> he says, he said, are you kidding me? A word jumble? I said, yeah, you know, where you kind of got to match the words with the statement, you know? He just, he's, he, he can't believe what he's hearing. And he says, oh, I'm going to give you a word. So he puts out Socrates, Plato. St. Augustine, it didn't really matter, right? I know Augustine is not the philosopher per se. So as a result of such, he puts these quotes. One of them is pure Augustine. You, it's, I prayed it was pure Augustine. <laughs> so I write the name Augustine, and then I put Socrates and all the other ones. <laughs> now you know where I'm going. Yeah, you're right. See, you're catching on. <laughs> You are worth your salt. There you go. And just so you know, the young guy behind me, keep going. I need the help. Keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. We need more than five. I'm thinking, really? Right? So he, he takes it. I hand him my paper. I'm sitting right there. He gets right, he grades him in class, and I watch him. And I'm counting two, four, six, eight, ten. He gets to the essay. He looks at it, and he looks at me, and I'm kind of, you know. He gets to the end, and then he, y'all, it's priceless. He gets to the, the bonus section. He looks at it. He gets it. He looks at it. He looks at me, and I went. <laughs> he said, yeah. I said, yes. I passed. Yes. <laughs> My brother and sister Christ, that is worth your salt. My brother and Christ, that's exactly the gospel. Is the good Lord saying, are you worth your salt, or should I throw you out and you get trampled underfoot? Now, let me tell you why that's important to the Jewish people, to the Roman people, to the apostles. In their day, you men worked for Rome. And the way you were paid is in salt. This is where we get the Latin term salary, salarium. So if you were going to battle, you would be paid in salt because paying you in money is irrelevant because there's not a stop and go along the way. 
So you can use your salt to preserve your food, which is obviously important, or you can use it to purchase a slave. This is where we get the term, are you worth your salt? Because you're giving up a food preservative. So from, the ma from a, a male standpoint in Roman society, they get it. To the apostles, there was a guy by the name of Elisha who used blessed salt to decontaminate a well. That well today still runs clean. 2,000 and something years later. So he's telling his apostles, are you worth it or are you not? Now, next time you look at a Last Supper painting, you know the one where you, all the apostles are getting a photo op, so they all get on one side to eat, right? If you look closely at the elbow of Judas, he's knocked over the table salt. That's where he's going with it. So my brother says, Christ, all of our best players in Scripture are those that are worth their salt. But they didn't start out that way. So for case in point, Saul to Paul. Look, nobody wants to help Saul. As a matter of fact, when he's blind, Aeneas doesn't even want to go cure him. The good Lord has to appear, well, I won't say appear, but in that many words, he's actually got to tell Aeneas, you go to Second Street and you need to cure a guy named Saul. You know what Aeneas' argument is to God? I don't think you want to do that. That guy kills Christians. I cure him, he sees, he kills Aeneas. We leave him blind. He said, go do what he's got to do because he'll be a great orator for me, the Gentile church. He goes from Saul to Paul. You want to talk about somebody worth their salt? That's, that's Paul. I mean, let's be honest. We stoned him so bad on his, one of his first homilies. They thought they left him for dead. Number of the ships that he gets on, they all sink. And let me tell you, he was in the drink one time for 24 hours. And then when he finally gets to the island of Cyprus, grab this. He goes to get near a fire and a viper bites him. That's the measure of the resolve. He's worth his salt. My brother and sister in Christ, you and I can say what we want about uh, Mary Magdalene, but she has all seven demons. Nobody in Scripture has that. She's worth her salt. My brother in Christ, you and I never speak about Peter's wife. Her name's Porphyria, by the way. Man, she's got game. Well, because if she doesn't agree with what Peter's got to do, he'll never become the vicar of Christ. Man, she's got to be able to take care of herself now. She's got to be her own fisher person, if you will. She's got to take care of the house. He's got a couple of boats. It's all on her because he's got to start traveling. You know, she's martyred in the same day, we believe, or at least very minimally the same week. My brother Christ, that is what it means to be worth your salt. It doesn't matter where you came from. It's where you go from this day forward. So now here you and I sit 2,000 years later. Are you and I worth our salt? Well, let's see. Or when you tell somebody, I will be there, you're going to be there because you gave your word you were going to be there. You don't care what happens in the world. You don't care who calls you, the email or text message. You said you were going to be there. You're showing up. Are you going to be there when you tell them, hey, look, I'm going to call you later. And that will happen. Your word is your bond. My brother in Christ, I'm begging you, do not get caught up in the world where you get caught up in the contractual things. For example, I, I, wouldn't, I would like to help you at work, but according to my job description, that's not me. Or as a matter of fact, worse, I'm sorry, I don't get paid to do that. Now we've tied our name to a decimal point. The last guy that did that is Judas. You know how things ended up for him. It would have been better you never been born, quote, end quote, to Judas. My brother in Christ, when you give your word, that's your bond. We can have 10 Wall Street attorneys write a contract, but it's only as good as the signature on it. It's only as good as your word. If, so, you what? if somebody comes to you and says, look, I got something to tell you. Don't tell nobody else. This is between you and I. Is that where it stays? No matter what happens, what gets said, who comes to you, or what gets proclaimed, it's not leaving your lips because you gave your word because you're worth your salt that this will go down. My brother and sister Christ, when you tell somebody you're going to go by to see them, you make a point to go see them even though if it inconveniences you, that no matter what else is going on in the world, when somebody stands in front of you, are they the most important person in the world? The one in front of you, are they the most important person in the world or are they not? Mother uh, Teresa was right. The one in front of you is the most important person in the world. And so when they asked her, Mother, are you going to change the world? She said yes, one person at a time. She gave her word she was worth her salt. My brother's Christ, she has no money, and all she brought to the table was sacrifice. God so loved the world, I sent my son for the sacrifice of many. When you tell somebody you love them, you've told them you will sacrifice for them. This is why the good Lord is hammering on Peter. Peter, do you love me? Well, yeah. 
Yes, Lord. Peter, do you love me? Well, well, yeah, I love you. Peter, listen to me. Do you love me? Lord, oh my God, you're in front of the apostles. You know I love you. Well, someday they're going to take you where you don't want to go, upside down. And for three hours you'll proclaim the gospel. That is a man worth his salt. When you go into a conversation and you walk away, will people say, no, that goes a disciple of Jesus Christ. Man, when you sit down to pray, regardless if they call on you, you make the sign of the cross, everybody at that table knows that you're a good Catholic, you're a good Christian. That, that is a disciple of Jesus Christ. You are either worth your salt or are you not. That's all that's going to matter. Please tell me that Napoleon Bonaparte was right in this issue. Is the only time that you give your word is when you're not going to keep it. My brother and sister in Christ, are you or are you not worth your salt? Amen. 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 In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. React. To react. To respond. I've learned sometimes it's just better to think before you speak because the words you speak you may eat tomorrow. My brother and sister in Christ, that is that gospel. It's about reaction. The good Lord shows up to his apostles and he comes through the door and he's got to say it twice. Peace be with you. Why? Because their reaction is just the opposite. Their reaction is they're scared. That's why they're behind locked doors. Their reaction is they're not expecting him to walk through. That's why he wants them to touch his wounds. My brother in Christ, their reaction is so, they're so nervous and full of anxiety. He's got to breathe on them. So that they know they feel something. Now remember this. Stop. Now make sure you understand something. Pentecost takes place 50 days after that night. But there is no Pentecost in the Gospels. It's only in the Acts of the Apostles. This is why the church puts it there. Remember, there are 10 guys locked behind doors on Easter Sunday night. Thomas is not there. Thomas doesn't get the memo. My brother in Christ, what I'm trying to get you to understand is, Every time the good Lord did something, he did something physical with it. Listen, this, listen, this is why every sacrament has an outward sign. This is why water gets poured on your head at baptism, so that you know your sins are forgiven because you felt the water. You wear a white garment so that you can see the child's soul as God sees it. That's why we put a white pall on your coffin, so everybody can see, hopefully, hopefully, how your soul is relative to this day of judgment because you've already been judged. You go to confession, you hear your sins are forgiven. You go to mass, you chew the host. Everything has an outward sign of an inward reality. Why? Because that's how they know the miracles. So when they ask the apostles, are you sure you saw him? Well, I had to because I felt him breathe on me. My brother in Christ, he's doing that to help them understand so that their reaction would be appropriate. Look, if you and I were to go back in scripture, I bet you, I tell you what, I'll prove it to you. I can tell you what somebody did, and I bet you know who they are by how they reacted. Here, case in point. I will tell you, do, I'll tell you what, do you know me? Let's see. I have two sons. Their names are Rufus and Alexander. I am a farmer by trade. I am a devout Jew. I will be there for the Passover. I will be there for all seven days. I do not want blood on me, because if I get blood on me, then I will not be able to participate in the crucifixion. I'll be quarantined for seven days up to 14 days. Yes, COVID is alive and well 2,000 years ago. My brother is Christ, but yet they pull me out of the crowd, and I have to carry the cross. Do you know me? You know me based on my reaction, that I am Simon of Cyrene, which is from northern Africa. You know that i got to leave my two children. That's what I'm worried about. That's why I don't want to get involved. When they conscript you in the army, and they can, I don't know when I'm coming back. It could be a day. It could be a week. It could be up to a month. I've got two children. Who's going to watch over them? Now i got blood on me. I can't even participate in the, in the sacrifice of the Passover. My brother and Christ, if I were to tell you that she was a devout Christian, that she truly believed God to be the Messiah, that she worked so hard at getting close to our Savior that when he's wearing a prayer shawl, which ends about right here. So these tassels would have been way up here, but that she touched the tassel and she was cured. Would you know who I am? The problem is you don't know my name, but the truth of the matter is you do. Because later on, I'm going to hold up the whole crucifixion and I'm going to pull out a veil and wipe his face. 
So you do know me. And my name is Veronica. You know how I reacted. My brother in Christ, if I don't touch his tassel, then according to tradition, I can't stop the crucifixion to get his face. It's how I reacted. If I told you, my brothers and sisters, that my husband came home one night and told me that he was going to be fishers of men, I got to tell you, it wasn't my best conversation. We live off the Sea of Galilee. We have boats. We have to use fish to pay taxes and to eat. So when he tells me he wants to be a fisher of men, I have to tell you, I wasn't very polite with him. But yet, at the end of the day, when push comes to sub, when my husband was crucified upside down, I was also martyred on that same day or week. My name is Porphyria, and I'm the wife of Peter. My brother and sister in Christ, what I'm trying to tell you is people will know you're a follower of Jesus Christ on how you react. Think about what I'm telling you. 2,000 years later, how do you, you and I react? When people are watching you and I, when the good Lord's watching you and I, how would he know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ? How will our family know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ? How would anyone know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ unless it was based on how you reacted? Well, let's see. My brother and sister in Christ, how do you react when somebody cuts you off in traffic? How do you react when somebody drives by you and says, you're number one? Do you speed back up to let them know that there's two spots for number one and they too have the other one? Maybe you drive up next to them just to give them the look. Maybe they're, they're, they're a Sunday driver. The problem is it's Monday afternoon. Maybe they've been turning for a whole block now to turn right, and it's about to drive you crazy. Maybe the person behind you, the, 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 the light has just turned green a nanosecond, and they've already honked. Did you purposely park there just to make it a little more irritating? Do you make sure you pull out even slower? My brother and sister in Christ, how do you react when you go into Walmart and there's 50 people and there's one checkout line? How do you react when the person in front of you has about 15 items because you counted them and you're the 10 item or less line? My brother and sister in Christ, do you judge them by what they have in their carriage? Well, that's the last thing they need to be eating. I can tell you, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. My brother and sister in Christ, how do you react when you get that email? that says, man, you and the horse you came in on. What about you get that text message? Or man, if you find out on the gospel of Facebook, the gospel of Facebook, that somebody has taken umbrage with you about your family. Maybe somebody even goes so far as to say that your mom and dad were not married when you were born. Man, how do you respond now? My brother and sister Christ, how you react? Do you think you're going to get people in a better spot? You think you're going to overcome evil with evil? Good Lord's already told you, when he says, when somebody hits you on your left cheek, give him your right. For me to hit you on your right cheek, I have to backhand you, which means I got to be verbally abusive. My brother Christ, how do you respond to that? My brother says, Christ, therein lies the point. If the good Lord was watching you and I, would he say, man, is that the only language that one knows? It's either GD or MF. 40,000 words in English language, and we only know about 10. Does he know that every time we speak, we're talking about somebody else? My brother and sister in Christ, the only time you give your word is when you don't plan on keeping it. My brother in Christ, would he he say, man, that's truly, that's the son of God. That no matter how much gossip comes out, the words out of your mouth is, let's pray for them. My brother in Christ, when somebody takes umbrage with you and tells you what they don't like about you, you just thank them for pointing it out and ask for their blessing. My brothers Christ, how do you react when the same person that comes up to you by the mere mention of their name causes you to spit? Can you react in such a way that is truly God-like? Or do you, are you keeping score? That you have to win every fight? That the argument gets so loud that, man, it's almost a volume issue. My brother Christ, therein lies the point. I got to get you to understand how you react starts out with little things. True story. Man goes into a church. It's vacant. He comes and sits in the front row. He begins to pray the good Lord. He says, you know, Lord, between me and my brother, it's pure hate. He said, it's got to stop. I can't take it anymore. We can't even breathe the same oxygen. No matter what we go to together, it turns into a free-for-all. We're arguing, we're pushing, we're kicking. He said, literally, we got to be separated physically by people. Something always happens. He gets up, he walks out of church. He's walking across the parking lot, and he sees his brother. His brother thinks he gave him the signal. 
whatever that may be. His brother literally stops the car in the middle of traffic and a free-for-all in the church parking lot. People are coming, pulling them off. Police are called, separating them. They finally get them separated. He finally comes back in the church. After it's all said and done, he sits back in the front row and says, Well, Lord, thank you for that for being so understanding, for giving me the patience and the fortitude to deal with my brother. And then he hears the good Lord speak. My child, how is it did you plan on growing in patience and endurance if I don't send a test for you? I gave you the grace. You came into my home. I gave you the fortitude to withstand it. But you didn't use it. You relied on you. The fact of the matter is, you should have just relied on my grace. And not acknowledge that sign, which, by the way, wasn't the sign you thought it was. My brothers and sisters in Christ, therein lies the point. How you react to issues is just the point. If you do not react right on little things, how will you react on big things? In Scripture, when the man said he cleans his house and got rid of the demon, and then all of a sudden the demon circulates and then comes back, and next thing you know there's seven demons, he got his house and cleaned it, but he didn't put it in order. When you and I commit the same sins over and over and over again, are you praying for the fortitude? Are you praying for any of the virtues to fill the hole? Are you? In other words, are you praying for justice? Are you praying for temperance? Are you praying for prudence or fortitude, the strength to be prudent? If you don't pray for the virtue, you and I won't make it. My brother in Christ, how will anybody know you're a follower of Christ if you don't show it in how you react? Sometimes the best answer is no answer. Sometimes the best response is none. It speaks volumes, my brother and sister in Christ. Remember, no matter what happened to you in your past, I do not care and neither should you. Somebody did something to you or you did it to somebody else. It happened so long ago, it marred you. You are not a prisoner to your past. Brother, it just happened. It did and you got to move on. You got to cut it loose. If you do not cut it loose, your reaction will be, it will carry over into dinners, vacations, sunsets, my brother and sister Christ, don't you get it? The devil wants you to walk backwards through life, hitting everything in its path. Why? Because he wants you to focus on what doesn't matter. It's all a lie. He's trying to get you to react based on what has happened. You are not a prisoner to your past. My brother and Christ, you need to be a pioneer of your future. And whatever's happened to you has happened. And someday you'll cross somebody else. And they'll say to you, you do not understand. And you'll tell them, I'm writing the book that you are now reading that you do understand. My brother Christ, I'm telling you, careful the words you use today, for tomorrow you may have to eat them. You may spend all day being excited that you responded well. Then next thing you know, you get so upset, you'll spend the next three days trying to figure out how to apologize for that argument you should have never been involved with. Careful how you react. You will not overcome evil with evil, only with love of God. And with his grace. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.